semester project. And, you know, I can, can never encourage you enough to get an early start thinking about it. Um, discuss it on the online forum. Email me or your thoughts. Email me drafts of your document. All these things are good things to do as far as your project goes. Um, we, we spent last week, or a good portion of last week, talking about design and web design. And the one thing um, to emphasize, I think, above all other things is when we speak of, of web design, we're speaking in terms of how a site can be organized and how a site can be designed to assist users in achieving their goals. And, and that's our criteria for a good design. Um, these aren't works of art. You know, we're not going to print them out and hang them on our refrigerator or anything like that. Right? Our goal is to be functional and to provide functionality and provide users with an easy way to do what they want to do when they visit their site to achieve their goals. Um, anyone have any parting thoughts on this before we get a little more specific and talk about the project? I had sort of a question. Sure. So, um, I know that you, um, when we were talking about how I8 doesn't like uh, mm -hmm. the header tags and all that kind of stuff. So, right. Um, and then you gave us a workaround for mm -hmm. that. And I wasn't exactly sure if we were supposed to use the, the div tag and, and, and navigate that way or should we have used that package that you did? Um, or does it matter? Or? That's a decision that, that, uh, that you have to make. Probably the better way to do it would be to put the workaround in for IE and, and uh, um, code, it, you know, code it using the, 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 the HTML5 tags such as headers and so on. It probably would be the preferred way to do it. And you just, you just sort of paste it in and mm -hmm. it'll work? Should. All right, there's one more th thought that I have on design, and I'm including it here, even though it doesn't per se relate to design, but just to um, remember where our priorities are and remember what's important. There's, there's an old saying in web development, and that is, content is king. Or if you prefer, content is queen. Maybe we can simplify it and simply say content rules. All right. And I bring this up when talking about design, if for no other reason but to point out that remember why you're making the website. You're making the website maybe to communicate an idea or to allow people to do something, allow people to purchase goods or to find out about your school's programs or, or whatever. The design is meant to serve that content. The design is the things that you do to help express that content uh, in the most simple and the most understandable and the most efficient way possible. You know, so the content is really what drives the people to the site. No one is going to visit your site to look at it and say, wow, that's a lovely site. All right. People will go and visit your site because they found a great article on your site about some topic that they're interested in. Or they were able to get advice on how to fix their PC. Or they were able to purchase something um, really good, uh, you know, and they were able to find exactly what they needed. Uh, um, to buy. So let's remember that, that, that content is what drives this, that design are the things that we do to um, serve uh, the content and, and to express uh, the content. All right, um, what I want to go over now is, is, is the design for your project. And the design for your project consists of five phases. And let's see how well I remember them. Um, they used to be, well they still are, they used to be in a book, but 
they didn't jump out of the book. We just, I just don't require the book for this class anymore. Uh, it is uh, available, plus I have copies of it if anyone wants to look at, at the book. Uh, it is called The Elements of User Experience, uh, and it's written by a fellow named Jesse James Garrett. And he suggests that you can view a website as being on several different planes, you know, several different levels. All right? And the idea of design is to sort of work your way through these levels. Each level is important. It's not as though one level uh, takes precedence over the others. Um, but the idea is, is that they all build upon each other to, to sort of serve the goal of creating a, a good design. Um, these levels are, and let's see if I, can, if I can remember them. These levels are, Strategy, scope, structure, skeleton, and surface. All right. One thing you'll notice about these, these uh, levels as we go down the line is that it goes from sort of vague and conceptual to more and more and more concrete and tangible. So the higher you're up on the list, you're, you're talking in terms of ideas, concepts. Some things are a little less tangible. But as we move down the design process, we're moving into things that become more and more and more tangible until we finally have the actual website. <coughs> All right. Um, essentially what we're doing is we're taking these ideas and we're, we're making them real. We're, we're turning them into a, a real project from these, from these sort of vague ideas. So each step is sort of getting more and more real, more and more tangible. All right. I'm going to give you an overview of these, um, these stages, and then we'll talk about each stage um, one at a time. Strategy. Strategy, by and large, relates to identifying the goals of the website. If we allow that a well-designed website is a site where the users can easily, easily accomplish their goals, <coughs> all right, we better have an idea what those goals are before we try to design a site. You know? So the first thing that we do is identify the goals of the people that are going to be visiting our site and in addition, identify the goals of the organization that's creating the site. I'm going to say organization for creating the site. You know, it could be a business, it could be a nonprofit organization, it could be academic, like a school, it could just be a person. You know, uh, but you're creating the site for a reason. What is the reason that you're creating the site? That's, it. That's the first stage, the strategy stage. It's the setting the, the, the grand design of, of what we hope to accomplish by developing the site. And in addition, what we expect our users will want to accomplish by visiting this site. All right? We'll talk about that more in a minute here. The scope is, if you will, the tactics or the requirements of what the site needs to do to help achieve those goals. Just about any goal you can approach several different ways, right? If your goal is to get rich, Right? That's your goal, let's say. Forget about web design for a second. Your tactics for getting rich could include, um, you know, going to school and learning a topic that you think is lucrative. Your tactics could include buying a lot of lottery tickets. Your tactics could include um, training for athletics. All right? Um, and so on down the line. So given a goal, there's a lot of different tactics you can take or, or things that you can do to try to achieve that goal. And 
again, we can start off with the goals because that keeps us focused on what it is we hope to accomplish and what our users hope to accomplish. But then we need to go and make it a little more tangible to say, well, what are we going to do to help the user achieve those goals? What are we going to put on the site? What content are we going to put on the site that will help the users achieve their goals? And that's in the scope phase. All right. So again, we're getting more and more tangible. We start out just with goals. Then, well, what would help the user achieve those goals? All right. The next step is structure, which relates to organize the material. In other words, we have defined a whole bunch of content in the scope phase. All right. It's our notion that that content is going to help the user achieve their goals. Well, another thing that will help the user achieve their, their goals is if that content is organized effectively, right? Because you could have all the information in the world in a big old heap, and that's not going to let the user easily achieve their goals or find what they're looking for. So one thing that we do is we structure it. Take the library, for example. You know, thousands of books in a library, you know. A lot of good content there, probably content that would help you achieve any goal that you'd like, right? But what if there was just a big old pile of books in that building, you know, just laying on the floor, a big old pile of books, you know. You wanted uh, some information about chemistry, you know, you'd go down, sit next to the stack, pick up the first book, look, that's not it, toss it over your shoulder, look at the second one. It'd be useless, all right? Um, all the content in the world is not useful unless the user can find it. And what we can do to find it is structure it in a logical way and structure it in a way that's going to be understandable to the user. So that's sort of the structure phase of this. All right. This, of course, re of course relates largely to navigation. All right. How are we going to allow our users to navigate through the content so that they can find it easily? The skeleton phase, then, um, is related to a particular kind of diagram called a wireframe. And a wireframe is a 30,000 feet view of what our page is going to look like. It's not the details of what's going to be on every page, but it's things like, well, on every page I'm going to have a banner that identifies my organization, identifies my site. And maybe at the bottom of every page, I'm going to have a footer that says, that has an email that people can use to contact us, and maybe a phone number if they need to contact us. And along the right side is going to be some sort of navigation. And along the left side, there's going to be some other stuff. All right? This is where we sort of come up with a layout, a basic template for the way our pages are going to look. All right? One general rule of web design is that consistency is good, right? So if you go to just about any website, you'll see that most of the pages are laid out about the same way, all right, as other pages on that site. Um, if we look at LC's website, we'll notice that If we go to any page on this site, this stuff on the top stays the same. I say it stays the same because we can't get to a second page, so of course it stays the same. All right, we go to any page here, the top stays the same. All right. In addition, there's a sidebar over here that is different for each area, yet there's some consistency in that 
This is sort of the sub-navigation for that area. In other words, if I go into the current students area, there's some information here relating for relating to current students, sort of a sub-navigation. If I go to future students, there's a slightly different version here, but basically there's the same thing. There, there's a list of topics that are relevant to future students. If I go to business and industry, again, I get a different thing still. So it's consistent in that there's always sort of a sub-menu over here, but it does vary a little bit in that depending on what section of the site you are, um, uh, the, the, the specific content is different. So that's sort of the idea of a wireframe. All right. Every one of these pages, we could draw a sketch and say how they look. There's a set of tabs on the top. There's this banner here. There's a heading here. There's a submenu here. There's some announcements over here. And there's a big old content area there in the middle. All right. That's what we mean by a wireframe. And the fact that there's some kind of consistency is comforting to the user, right? Because the user knows that if they want to find something, well, this is where it was because that's how it was on all the other pages, you know? In effect, the structure of your page, the wireframe you have, sort of teaches the user how to use your site and how your site is organized. The last, go ahead. Are there any special tools that are good for creating wireframes or are they kind of graphical in nature or are they uh, outline form? Um, that, we'll talk about that more in detail. Um, I am more, um, how do I want to say this? I, um, I am more interested in the thought process and the design process that happens as opposed to the output. Therefore, hand sketched wireframes are fine, fine by me as long as I can read them. All right. Um, again, remember the, the purpose of these documents. All right. The purpose of these documents, there, there's a few different purposes. Number one is, you know how like in math, like in, if, you're, if you're like in eighth grade math, they say show the work, all right? The documentation that you do, in other words, the design document that you prepare, is sort of you showing the work of how you came up with the website that you came up with. Why do you need to do that? Why do you need to show the work, all right? You need to show the work because first of all, if you don't show the work, if you try to jump right to the finished website, you're liable to miss some stuff. All right? This is sort of a systematic process to go through to help you ensure that you don't miss anything. So by asking you to show the work and by creating a design document, that helps guarantee that you've gone through a certain thought process. And this is a thought process that uh, again, has been shown to develop the most effective websites. You know, very few things that you know in web design or even software design are what I would call theoretical. You know, it's not like someone says this is the best way to do it because of all these highfalutin theories. All right, when we say something's a good practice to do, it's because we've observed that when people don't do it this way and try to just, for example, sit down and bang out a website they come up with ineffective websites. So this is like, the, the, these theories have been developed in the school of hard knocks, right? You know, the, the things that work and have worked over time, that's what becomes sort of our practice in developing websites. So, the, the, so one reason that you do this is to show the work so that you, you go and you work through the problem systematically all right. Second thing to do is you may need to communicate your thoughts about the project before you're actually ready to build it, right? You may be working on it with a team of, of, of web developers on it. You might not be the only person working on the project. So you need to make sure everyone's on the same page, you know, and therefore you document it and you say what you're going to do. You might also want to communicate to your client, all right? In other words, you know, if you were building a house, you wouldn't necessarily tell the architect what you want your house to look like, and then the architect come back six months later and say, well, there's your house, right? You'd want to see some drawings first, make sure you have the right number of bathrooms, and so on and so forth. These documents are a way of showing the people that you're developing the website for, this is what I'm planning to do, all right? Why? 
Well, because at that point to change it, it's no big deal, right? If you're talking about changing a plan and that plan only exists on paper, it's not hard to do. If you're talking about changing a up and running website, then that can require substantially more work. All right, so we want to put as much effort as we can in the early phases to make sure we know exactly what we want to do so that we get a website that's going to be useful to the organization. Kind of the last phase of the design process is the surface page. And that's where we develop a prototype. What's a prototype? Can anyone define the word prototype or describe it? Pardon me? A working model. A working model. That's a good way to put it. Um, does a working model do everything that the end product is going to do. No. Then it wouldn't be a model, right? Then it would be the thing, right? If I were going to build, if I was going to, if I were going to create a model car that did everything that a real car is going to do, then it wouldn't be a model car. It would be a real car, <laughs> right? So therefore, a prototype captures some of the essential characteristics of the completed product without capturing everything. So there's enough in the prototype to give everyone an idea of what the end product's going to look like, yet you haven't spent so much work on the prototype that it's going to be difficult to say, well, you know what, we want to change that, get rid of that, and put something else in. So that's sort of the idea of a prototype. And in, in web development, the prototype will be, you know, rough drafts of HTML pages. It will be HTML pages, maybe where, maybe not all the links work, Maybe the colors aren't exactly right, but you know you, you have the start of web pages um, and, and working enough to show folks how the, the uh, finished site is going to look like. All right, let's go through these steps in more detail now, now that we've seen these. And, and to, to kind of finish our overview, if you notice again, we go from very conceptual what are the goals? What do people want out of the site? To, well, what are we going to put on the site to help achieve those goals? How are we going to organize it? How are we going to organize each page? Finally, what the page is going to look like. So we've gone from very vague to very specific. The first section of the strategy section relates to goals. And there's goals both for the organization creating the site and for the site visitors. The hope is that there's going to be some overlap, right? That well, the goals aren't necessarily identical, that there's going to be some overlap between the goals of the people visiting the site and the goals of the organization. For example, let's say I was a band creating a, a website for, for my band. All right? My goals might be something like sell more concert tickets. All right? Might be to get new listeners might be to connect with my current fans so they know what's going on if we have new recordings or new appearances coming up. All these things might be goals that, that the band has. Right? Now these goals could be achieved any number of different ways. Right? But that's not what we're talking about in the strategy section. In the strategy section, you're talking about identifying goals. Now what might the goals of a visitor be? Well, goals of a visitor might be to find out when, when the band is playing uh, someplace nearby. All right? Or whether they have any new recordings out. Or to find out if this is the kind of band that they're going to like. Maybe a friend of theirs said, you know, hey, you know, you like band A, you might like band B. All right? So you check them out. Go to their website, check them out, play some samples. Now again, I think you can see that while the Goals aren't the same, there's enough overlap. And there's things that you could put on the site that help achieve both those goals. You know, maybe a listing of, of uh, 
concerts, um, samples of the music, you know, those sorts of things. So, what I'm asking you for the, the project is to identify the three main goals for both of these groups. The organization that you're creating a site for and the visitors of the site. Now, a few things about goals. The goals relate to the content of the site and re relate to what the users want to get out of the site. The goal should not relate simply to just good web design. Let me give you a for instance. A lot of times I'll see in the goal section someone saying that one of their goals of the organization is to have a good easy navigation. That's not a goal. That's a means to a goal. All right? Or even put differently, that's just a basic web design principle. All right? Put differently, when would you not want to have a good navigation? You know? You don't really need to say that. All right? That's just part of the, the process of web design. Put differently, that's not what you hope out of your website. You don't hope when the day is done that you've developed a website with a great navigation. You know? So that everyone looks and says, wow, have you seen their navigation? It's great <laughs> navigation, right? What do you hope for? You hope for, if you're a band, more fans coming to your concerts. That's what you want out of the site. Um, if you're a school, maybe more students. Maybe uh, students uh, that, that, uh, that are less confused about what programs your school offers. You know, better informed students. Um, if you're a business, maybe selling more of a particular product or making more people aware of the product offerings you have. That's what you get, want to get out of the website. Things such as good navigation or pleasing colors or whatever are a means to that goal. And we're not really going to talk about them because of course you want that. Of course you want your website to work well. So these goals should be related to the content. All right. So, in addition to that, I want you to identify um, three personas. All right. What personas are are meant to be three categories of representative users. A bad habit that software developers, especially web developers, get into is talking about the user as though there's one typical person out there that's going to be using their website. All right. In other words, well, the user is going to want to do this. The user is going to want to do that. That's not true, right? There's 7 billion possible users in the world, right? Give or take a billion, all right? Each one of those may have their own goals for visiting the site, you know? Let's think of Loring Community College's website. Someone might be visiting the site to find out what events are going on at Stocker Center. Someone might be visiting their site being a high school senior and wanting to know, uh, you know what programs um, they offer for uh, radiology or uh, radiology tech. A person might be a, someone working in information technology that wants to upgrade their skills. Another one might be an organization that wants to train a number of their people on a particular topic. All right. All of these are different users with different goals. So, if we talk about the user as though there's one user out there and we're writing our code to work for that user, we're kind of missing the boat. Now, obviously, we, we, we can and it's not practical to try to track down and interview the 7 billion people on Earth and find out why they might be visiting our site. All right. However, we can 
sort of hit a middle ground here. Instead of trying to identify one typical user or trying to address everyone in the world's problems, we can identify three or four categories of users. And again, depending on the size of the site, we might have more or less categories. For your assignment, I'm suggesting three categories of users. All right. So, for example, for a school, you know, what some might some of the personas be? One might be that of a high school senior trying to decide where they're going to continue their education. That might be persona number one. Do you think there's probably a lot of people in that category? Absolutely. There's a lot of folks that, you know, are trying to decide where to go to school, what are the advantages and disadvantages, does the school have the programs that I'm interested in, and so on. So that's a pretty typical category of user. All right. A second one might be, second category of user might be a community member that doesn't necessarily want to attend classes here, but just wants to know what events are going on, you know. Maybe, maybe what, what non-credit classes there are that they could take, you know, just for personal enrichment. Or what's going on at the Stocker Center, uh, what's going on at the film series, what, what's going to be playing this week, or, or whatever. All right. So that's the second category. Third category might be faculty and staff. All right. I use the website, for example, if I know I need to contact someone and I can't quite remember what their name is, but I know they work in the computer department and so, okay, let me see a list of the people. Oh, yeah, that's their name. That's their phone extension. Now, the point is, is that by identifying a handful of these personas, you're not developing a website that's going to address every single individual's needs, but you're going to catch most of your common users. All right. One suggestion I would have about software, especially websites, is make the common, typical things very easy to do. All right. And then, if there's anything else that you need to do, okay, if the user has to work a little harder for that, that's fine. But let's handle the basic things. Let's handle the things that most of the people are going to be visiting your site for. Let's handle those really well and real simple. All right. You know, it's the 80-20 rule, as they say, you know. Um, you know, uh, a large portion of your group is going to be there for 80% of your content, you know. There might be a few people that want the other 20%, but you know what? If they have to work a little harder, I'm less concerned about that than making the 80% of the people work real hard to find some basic information. So what does this mean for our project design? It means that as part of the strategy section, I want you to come up with three people. And the book, which we no longer use, but you can take a look at it um, if you're interested in the library or I have some copies, says make up a little story about these people. Try to give them a face. Try to make them as realistic as possible. In other words, my persona wouldn't be, well, one of them is a high school senior. My persona would be something like, my, uh, my uh, persona is Jacob Jones, a senior at Elyria High, has a 3.5 grade point average, and is interested in, um, what should Jacob be interested in? Jacob is interested in our new culinary program. His favorite websites are the Food Channel, Facebook, and um, I don't know. Recipes are us. All right. That's a persona. They even suggest getting pictures of these people to make them real realistic. Now, why do they do that? And that sounds a little hokey, you know, and that sounds like, you know, just sort of a cute thing. The idea is, is you really want to put yourself in those people's shoes. 
You don't want to think about this as some this 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 nameless, faceless blob of users out there. You want to, to do this for this person who is representative of a large group of your typical users. All right. <clears throat> so for example, the thought is is that if we can design a site that works for Jacob here, we're going to ha hit a large amount of our audience because a large amount of our audience is in a similar situation as Jacob is. So let's put a face on Jacob. Let's get a picture from some source uh, of pictures and let's make a little bio like this. It doesn't have to be extensive, you know, but make it as real as possible so that at different points of the design process, you can think and say, what would help Jacob decide that LC is right for, right for him or not? What are some things that Jacob would be interested in? You know? Alright? So, yes? And then in the actual website, as part of the content, would uh, possibly some of your graphics be closely related to that? If it was aimed at if your uh, persona was a uh, college student, maybe some of your, uh, your actual images would be college students and activities? Oh, yeah. In other words, the, the question was, is would you use images, et cetera, um, with these personas in mind? And the answer is absolutely. All right. The idea is, is when you're making this site, you think, look and think, what would Jacob like to see? What kind of graphics would Jacob be interested in? And, and so on down the line. Now, to be sure, you know, you can't generalize for high school seniors uh, any more than you can generalize for any other group of people. You know, a graphic or a color scheme or whatever that is very appealing to, to one individual might not be to others. But, you know, you can take a shot. Uh, again, you know, at, at some point, like I said, you can't develop a website for each individual uh, within your audience. So you try to break them down into groups. All right. Another persona might be a community member. You know, a 45-year-old woman that lives in the area, or maybe that's new to the area, and wants to know about the cultural opportunities here. All right. Another one might be a, a manager of an accounting firm that wants uh, their accountants to be um, brought up to date on tax law changes or something like that. I don't know. So that's the strategy section. That's the first section. To review, you'll define goals for the organization and for the site visitors. Three goals each. Top three goals. In addition, you define who your visitors are going to be in a little more detail by coming up with three personas which are three categories of representative users that you actually create a name and face for. Let me bring up the documentation that I have in Angel because in Angel I have a description of this and I also have an example that I cooked up. The elements of user experience. There's three documents that we're going to take a look at. One is the overview. That says what the basic requirements are. This one, I just want to introduce you to it. You can read through this on your own.
Here's a document that describes what you need to do in the design phase. And again, I defined what you're required to do, a description of your site's topic purpose, a prioritized list of three of your user go of your goals, a prioritized list of three of the user goals, three user personas, and then finally it should look professional. All right. Um, because there's a, a few folks that uh, just over time had questions about this and weren't sure what to do, I made a sample of what your design could look like. Now, Keep in mind this is meant to be an example. Is this the only way that you can do it? No. But what's good about this is this contains the information I'm looking for. So if you're looking for like, what do you mean by persona? You can take a look and, and see. So, in my project, my hypothetical project is about jazz music. Alright? So I have an overview that describes my site and what I'm looking for. Alright? Notice that it's not enough to say that my site is going to be about jazz music. You could make any number of different sites about jazz music, right? You could write, uh, you could create a site for college students that were studying music. You could create a site for professional musicians. You could create a site for grade school kids, high school kids. So you want to sort of refine it a little bit. You don't simply want to say I want to make a website about sports. Well, that's a huge topic. Are you talking about like as from a fan's perspective or from a participant's perspective? You know, every sport or winter sports maybe or whatever. So here I'm refining it and I'm talking a little bit about my goals here. I aim to create a site that people that don't know a lot about jazz can visit and learn more. So it's geared towards listeners and not um, musicians. So again, I've already sort of narrowed it down uh, a little bit. All right. Here's the organization goals. I want to broaden the popularity of jazz by educating people not familiar with it. I want to expand listeners' horizons by introducing them to music about which they're not familiar and to give a whole, uh, an overview of the whole history of jazz from beginning till now. In other words, I don't simply want to talk about current musicians or musicians from the past. I want to cover the range. Here's what I've defined my user goals to be. Find other musicians similar to musicians they already like. All right. Let's say someone maybe had a class and, and found out that they liked a particular musician. Well, gee, who's like that musician? All right. Define biographical background information and to get information that will assist them in building a jazz record library. Here's my personas. All right, Brad Parker, listened to jazz music growing up as his father. As he grew up, he stopped listening. Now as he's getting older, he's interested in rediscovering. So that's a person with one background. Someone whose maybe family had listened to it, but he really never paid attention. Now as he gets older, he's thinking, oh, maybe there's something to this, and I want to find out about it. Here's a student that's taken like a music appreciation class and didn't know much about the music before then, but now is interested and, and wants to build upon it. And then finally, here's a person that um, has some friends that listen to it and thinks, well, gee, maybe, you know, I, I like this, maybe I should find something else. So again, these are representative users. All right. These three things taken together, the overview, the goals, and the personas, that's the strategy part of the project. All right. The interesting thing is, is we are going to probably talk more about the first couple of items than we do the other three. All right. There's a good reason for this. There's a real famous diagram that relates to any kind of software development ever done. And that diagram looks like this.
This has been true since the first program was written and it'll probably be true for all eternity. What this graph shows is the relationship between the cost to make a change in a project and the phase of the project. I show this to almost every one of my classes. You don't have to memorize it. The key thing to, to note is the shape of this. All right. Any mathematical fans in the class? What's the, what's the first derivative of this? What can we say about the first derivative of this? It's positive. What does that mean? It means that not only is the cost increasing, it's increasing at an increasing rate. So this is a geometric, not a linear. So in other words, it's not just that the cost goes up like this in a straight line. The cost goes up and up and up, and it actually starts increasing faster and faster. Exponentially, yes. All right. So what does this mean? And again, this follows through the analogy that I had uh, about making a house. If I decide I want another bathroom in my house, when the architect is simply drawing out the plans, it probably doesn't cost that much to add a bathroom to it. All right. At least not compared to if I've moved in. All right and I have my whole family in there, and I have planted flowers out in the garden, and then I decide that I want an extra bathroom. All right. At that point, there's a lot more work, there's going to be a lot more expense. All right. So, think of this as, you know, we're coming up, we're designing it, we're making it, we're testing it, finally the site's live. The earlier that we can find a problem, the easier it's going to be to correct it. By easier, less time, less money. Therefore, we spend a lot of time in any, or we should spend a lot of time in any development project at the front end. And therefore, we spend a lot of time designing the site. And even beyond that, we spend a lot of time in the first phases of the design. Because that makes sure we're on the right track. Gee, if we get the color wrong on the surface, that's kind of like repainting a room in a house. All right? If we get how high the ceiling has to be or how many doors or windows it's going to be, that's a major structural change. So we want to get that stuff down right off the bat. So therefore, we're going to spend a lot of time identifying the goals and in the second phase, identifying the requirements. All right? The rest of it will go a little quicker. All right. I would again suggest you review these documents, review my sample, and review the requirements for the design. And next, next time we'll talk about the, the next phases of it. Yes. Okay. Did you have your hand up? Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. See you up in lab.